So, uh, hello everyone, welcome to the Cyber Weekly. I am Del Gracious Okello, your podcast host, and I am with Josephine Olok, my co-host. In this podcast, we talk about cybersecurity and all matters related to cyber with book reviews monthly on other areas besides cybersecurity. I am glad you made it. Uh, welcome, Josephine. Um, as we share, as I shared with you in the the notes, the the podcast notes, uh, we talked about uh, insurance and uh, security breaches. And I remember during the during the Fitspa event, we talked uh, people were talking about how the penetration reach for uh, for insurance is is a bit of a challenge to the point that only 1% of people are actually insured. Uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think with the, what we've noted with insurance, it is that it is considered a luxury service or product. So after, when people look at financial services that they use, mostly, most of them use the obvious ones, payments, um, you know, sending and receiving money is 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 key, and that and and the majority of of our members fall into the payment space. But when you look at insurance, insurance is seen as uh, a lux- luxury, and it's something that comes after your basics have been met. So for that reason, and it's also there's there's that aspect, but also the aspect of uh, perhaps a lack of understanding around insurance, what it entails. Because when you when you think through insurance, you can there are definitely benefits of of insurance for 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 everyone, including people who would not consider uh who would need insurance like farmers and all that because they are dealing with season seasonalities and all that. So it it is uh a a, a lack of understanding as well as people not thinking that they have the disposable income to take on insurance. Okay. Now, with regards to cybersecurity, do you find that the rich is actually gaining because of the breaches and all that? Do you find that people are actually now more leaning towards uh, getting insured, especially for cybersecurity? Uh, yes, when we look at our community, yes, there is the awareness. Um, and I'm sure, as you know, there are that it's cyber attacks uh, happen very often and most people uh, know that it's not about if but more about when um, and a lot of people have been attacked but are not necessarily being open about having been attacked so there is the understanding that yes it will help to have to be insured i think the challenge you have with the insurance is whether the products out there one are affordable and two whether they uh, actually meet the requirements uh, of insurance that 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 uh, the members need so there is um, there is a, uh, a a demand but the all that demand is not necessarily being fulfilled in terms of not the product not being available to to people who need to be insured on on uh, who need cyber insurance Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, situations where, uh, let's say, someone is a startup in times of cybersecurity and they're trying to set up a, an organization, do you find that insurance would be the ideal at that point, or they have to come up with the actually working product before actually getting insured? Sorry, uh, just let me understand the question again. Are you saying? Are you asking for when you're first setting up your company or? Yes, when you're setting up, is insurance the first thing you should think of or it is something which later on down the road that you already have a working product that you can also now put it on board with regards to like a cybersecurity product? Yeah, I think that, that speaks really to... to uh whether you can afford it or not obviously if you if you 
the best the best thing to do to mitigate risk is to look at all bases, to have more bases covered and to have insurance. The reality is that it's not necessarily going to be, uh, you're not necessarily going to be in a position where you can take on insurance immediately. I think what, um, what can help the business before you even go to insurance is make sure that you have everything that you need in place that mitigates against the attack. So you need to look at what technology you have to make to to have uh, to secure your business and your products, whether it is you having firewalls or whatever, and then what are your processes around it? Uh, in, how do you manage incidents? How do you deal with um how what policies do you have? And then what do you do about uh people? People obviously are a big part of of of, of cyber of 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 security, and if you don't um have those in place. If you're not creating uh, an awareness within your team, uh, you're not having looking at all the doing the, all the due diligence to bring on your staff. Um, if you're not taking care of those, then it would probably be premature to go and start saying, "Okay, want cyber insurance?" Because a lot of the times, what we've known, what we've discovered is that it's a very high risk to to get. Uh, to be insured for 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 insurance companies to take on cyber insurance, it's a high risk because it's for the frequency and the nature of it. So if you do not, uh, if you're not ready to be insured, if you don't have the mitigations um in place, then you're probably much more unlikely to get the insurance that you want. Yeah. So meaning, uh, it's quite. The criteria is quite stringent when it comes to actually you getting a package for insurance, and they don't have a standard figure for oh yes a yeah definitely because of the risk the risk in nature of it it's it's very high risk it's it's highly probable that most people will get attacked uh therefore you need to be able to prove that you've done everything you can to to mitigate the risks. Um, so that you become more, more, more insurable, um, so to speak. Um, if we dive right in when it comes to like cybersecurity breaches, uh, I want to piggyback on uh, what you already talked about concerning onboarding. So, uh, during the Milima event, which I attended yesterday, you found that onboarding being one of the key things because you find that you may employ someone who is either incompetent or has false documents in some way or in he's not capable or he's having some issue which is causing him to maybe steal money and all that uh, what are your takes when it comes to onboarding and uh, matters concerning that okay so on onboarding is uh it shouldn't be a one-off event. Uh, okay, onboarding obviously is a one-off event, but you have to com uh, continuously make sure you monitor uh, your staff. So onboarding should include, um, I mean, and I guess I guess also depends on the industry you're in, but obviously it needs to include verification of academic credentials, uh, verification, getting references for previous employers. Uh, and if you're working in a very, um, uh, in the, especially in the financial industry, it also helps to to be able to talk to other, um, especially associations. Uh, I know the bankers have a, a strong association, and they and it it, it helps to get uh, reference checks from associations like that because I think the bankers have a network where they have um, blacklists of of individuals who have perhaps uh, you know committed a fraud. Uh, in the organization that I work for. So I think having networks like that to do your due diligence, um, you can do the police records, you can do all that. And having done all that and you're satisfied that the person is is, is skilled as they say they are, uh, that the person worked uh, where they say they work and there was no food associated with where they worked and their conduct is good, uh, that, that obviously is a good start to onboarding the person, but it's also to make sure that you're constantly uh, uh, reviewing the person's performance 
but also checking for things like um, lifestyle changes, sudden lifestyle changes, when you're, especially when you're dealing with money. Perhaps when you're not dealing with money, it's another thing, but I think it's also good to monitor those uh, those thing indicators that could could uh, uh, point to some perhaps some fraud, some collusion that you have. If you're dealing with clients, it's also good to get uh, feedback from them as to how that person is conducting themselves. Uh, it, it's good to have um, a code of conduct within your organization, but it's also good to have um, uh, your a relationship with your clients, which talks to code of conduct. And I know with the financial industry, if you're working uh, as a, if, if your client is, say, a bank, then they expect that you you would uh, have your your employees are actually following some kind of ethical uh, standard or ethical code of, of conduct. So I think it, it's an ongoing thing because they are, people are most often uh, the weakest link when it comes to the cyber attacks or attacks or fraud or anything like that. So, uh, as uh, you noticed in the show notes, we talked of um, the security breaches which are happening in Kenya. Uh, and especially in this last quarter, do you feel like uh, there will be more or like in this situation of like, let's say Uganda or other countries, do you find that we are ready for such incidents. I think it's difficult to say whether we'll ever be ready. Uh, I think the my take is that the, the cyber attacks and the, and the and the and the people, the actors behind the threat actors behind them, are often ahead of of of, of the game. So they're actually taking doing much smarter things. So most you know, uh, if you, if you look at a lot of the incidences, most people have been hacked before they realize they've been hacked. So you you have somebody hacking into your network and sitting within your network and observing what is happening, maybe for months, uh, you know, before you real before something happens. And when that something happens, it's often too late because they've been sitting in your in your network. So I think the the threat actors are often ahead. So. If we do not try to be as ready as possible at every turn, then we'll always be behind. So I think it is about um, one having uh, having a much more obviously technically you want to be technically very good in terms of what you're doing, protecting your your networks. But I think what is even more important is collaborating with other institutions because you're not going to be able to to handle this on your own as an organization. So if you're part of an association, having a collaboration amongst your members, but also having the co collaboration with all the stakeholders, which include the regulators, the, the task forces that, that deal with cybersecurity, the police, the judiciary. So I think unless we have a very tight, um, a tight network or a form of collaborating, and unless we we look at it as a joint issue, and unless we react as quickly as possible when something happens in a collaborative way, we're always going to fall behind the, the threat actor. That's interesting. Um, now, when it comes to the bankers' associations, you find that uh, you have, uh, you said you have a, a list, a blacklist. How do you usually manage it? Like everyone contributes to it and uh, how often is it usually, you know, contributed to? And uh, second, yeah, first answer that one as I'm processing the next <laughs> question. Yeah, because I'll probably forget the first question. So, yeah. so I'm not I'm not a member of the Bankers Association. Uh, just to let you know, um, it's the the bank the Bankers Association is made up of banks, um, and I I'm not I'm not a oops, sorry, I'm not not a, a member. But my assumption is, and my the knowledge I have is that there should be some kind of um, uh, data base or of sorts where they 
able to 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 know who who's been committed fraud and all that. The extent to which it is used, uh, how it's updated, those details I don't have. Um, obviously, it's something that when you think about it, it would be nice to have. Uh, but of course, when you have to consider uh, whether you know the legality surrounding uh, that the information, especially for the individuals who are involved who are in that list. So um, I I can't claim that they have the list. I'm just assuming that they do. Um, and I and I think sometimes it's more about um, the you know when you do your your check with your association members, it's not. Can you look up this person for me? It is what have you heard about this person, or do you know anything? It's, it's perhaps much more um, informal than it is formal, but that, that's all I, I really can say about that. Now, in case of a breach, now a good example of um, these security breaches which are happening. In case of a breach, how proper would you react to it if, like? One of the CISOs came to you and they told you, ah, we have this breach. And uh, our way forward is either to like, remove a service or the bank is halted for quite some time. How do you usually manage the situation? And does it ever reach to that point? Okay, I've, I've been lucky that I've not been involved in something uh, significant. But I think what this is where having a process has to kick in, um, and you need to decide what 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 action to take based on what you think of each is. So I think engaging the the process and constituting a team, um, and having somebody take decisions around what action you're going to take. So what how severe is the the breach? First of all, is it is it is it very severe? If it is. What is the action you take? Take off, take go offline, report, consider team. So th those are all things which are should be very clear in your process, and it should be so rehearsed that when it happens, you don't then start looking for oh, oh what do we do next? Yeah, because in your process you should be able to to know that if you're a regulated entity, you need to report to the central bank. If you're a regulated entity, you need to report to the central bank to say. Perhaps my I'm taking my services offline. Uh, taking your services offline also means uh, that you 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 hopefully that you're you're limiting further damage to, to your systems. But you also make have to make sure that your process is in place where you have secured your your backups and hopefully your backups you've not been replicated uh, not replicating data or. Um, You've not been replicating data, which is already also compromised. So you, you need to have all these processes in place and a, a systematic way of dealing with an incident, which is a process, a policy, a rehearsed um, a policy, and also uh, so that you can mit you can mit mitigate uh, further damage. Um, one of the things that we all guilty of is is having policies and not following through on um, on on testing and 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 you know we talk, we do a lot of backups. So do you ever test them? Uh, we we have risk plans. Do you ever test them? Um, you you have a crisis management team. Do you ever constitute it? Uh, do you have a rehearse a scenario where you've had you've been hacked and you have to go to the media, you have to go to your regulators? Uh, do you know what happens when who is the spokesperson when something like that happens? And of course, uh, it's it depends on the level of the issue. So sometimes the spokesperson may have to be the very top level of uh, person in the organization. It could be your board member or it could be your CEO. But depending on the issue, it could be your CISO. The CISO might be able to deal with the issue internally uh, without you going externally. But I, I think all those are things which um, should be very well articulated in your process, should be rehearsed, and should be clear. But there, there's many levels of, of, of what you need to do. And uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, when, when you say you've got, you've got a breach and, and, and your data has been 
in encrypted or whatever it is on can access it and you're being asked for a ransom you need to be able to have a policy on whether or not you you pay for the for the ransom or not if you don't then you don't you don't go ahead you 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 hope you hope you hope, you mean the idea is that you you don't go ahead because you put in place a, a, a lot of effort to make sure that your backups and all that are secure uh, and you, you're confident that you, you, you can quickly recover from that. So, yeah, so that, that is basically what I would say okay. about that. Well, I have a little scenario here. Uh, I would want to get your take on how you would perceive it. Um, it's part of my newsletter. I wrote something small here. And um, part of it, it's about a breach. And uh, I would want to know how you would perceive it as a what? As a, a board member. So this is uh, it's actually an actual breach which has been in the news. Uh, it's about... Uh, uh, Cisco devices. The operating system of Cisco has been breached and it has an issue concerning uh, the HTTP and HTTPS, basically the things which connect the server. And what is happening is the attackers are using this zero day to affect other, to escalate privilege to be able to create their own users, delete other user accounts. And currently the best remediation is to uh, blacklist some IP addresses and keep on checking for <clears throat> possible users who you haven't placed in the system. Uh, what's your take on it? And how would you react to such a situation? Okay, you have approached me as a board member. Yeah, uh, and you're a CISO. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. first thing I'd ask you is, because what you've told me is 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 technical, meaning I have not understood. There's a I've understood that there's a breach, but I've not understood the impact on the business and how severe this is in terms of how it affects our operations. So what I'd ask you is, what is the impact? And what do you need, what support do you need us to be able to manage this? So this is a question that comes back to you. Because you've told me a lot of, of, of things, but I've not really understood how this impacts the, the business, the operations. So I'll ask you, what is the impact of this breach? What does it mean for our business? What do you need support for us to do? Do we need to talk to our regulators? What do you need? What support do you need from the board? Okay. So, um, meaning that I need to bring more numbers next time. <laughs> it, it has to be at the level where I understand, because at the, at the level of the board, I am looking at protecting the interest of the company. All the all the stakeholders of the company, shareholders, everybody within the business. So I'm 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 concerned about what how this affects the business. I'm concerned about how this affects our reputation. I'm concerned whether we are compromising any data that's related to our customers. So if if you are uh, approaching this, I would suggest you say we've had a breach. This is what we think is going is impacted data records systems these systems we use to to do our to run our operations therefore we cannot run our operations this is going to have an impact on our reputation therefore we need to talk to our six stakeholders from the board and it spoke speak numbers which makes sense so for the board for the board I, what i need your support on is i need you to I need resources to do this and this. I need you to, to do this. I need your approval to, to, to take down systems. 
or I need this. So it needs to be very clear in language, which is clear to understand. Because I, uh, as a, an, a tech, an IT person, I understood what this, how this breach, uh, understand when you describe the breach, yes, the, how the breach happens. But I have not, even even as an IT person, I really not understand and understood. It's like you give me, you present me something, then I'm like, okay, so so then what? Yeah, you you get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let me try a second approach okay. because this podcast is all about this. Um, so. Uh, this bridge was discovered by Cisco on the 28th of September this year, and it affects uh, Cisco devices, the operating system which Cisco uses to operate its devices. And the level of this bridge are, has the uh, is able to actually affect the business how someone from anywhere in the world is able to access our devices and through the internet because it's it's that interface which we usually use to access our devices through the internet so someone is able to access our devices and create different users delete our accounts meaning we have no control over the device itself making them admins meaning that they can do anything from changing user accounts uh, manipulating data from any other source and meaning that you can even choose to stop our connection to actually our network itself because remember the cisco devices are the ones which control the networks we usually use so that's my take uh, and my remediation for this issue is we should first switch it off, especially the uh, part of the connecting to the internet. The HTTP and HTTPS ports need to be switched off, meaning no one from the outside is able to access our devices on the inside. Or alternatively, we could place our firewall on that we can, uh, someone from the outside is not able to access our our devices from the inside is that better uh yeah yeah better but still be improved so maybe i would ask you is um well thank you that you've 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 taken the action to to switch off our connection to the internet meaning that you're you you're meaning not eliminating but you're reducing the the, the access the access of of the of those people who are attacking us. By the way, um, but now what I would also ask is, what is your assessment of the damage that's been done, and and how does switching off the internet affect our business? Currently, uh, switching off the internet we don't mean switching off the entire internet that no one is able to access the internet. We mean switching off the devices access to the internet i don't know if you get my point meaning that nobody from the outside is able to access our device from the inside then so how, uh, how does that impact how does it impact our operations when we, when that happens or does it not have an impact it will affect our impact in a way that um okay I'm now lost. <laughs> the questions there. <laughs> you you uh, you've approached me as a board member, so I, for me, I have to understand how this is affecting the business. Remember, it's it's a crisis, yeah, okay. so and we need to make decisions quickly based on the information that you've given us. So, mm -hmm. it it has to be based on how what is how is it impacting us, what 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 is the the risk to our to our customers, to our employees, or whatever. Especially when if somebody has been having access to a to a network, 
it means that we we have the biggest risk is that our data is could be compromised. Okay. So how are we? What what is your assessment of the of that? What has happened? Um, my assessment is currently uh, forty thousand devices abroad have been attacked by that same issue, and I'm trying to come up with remediations to avoid it affecting us. Currently, we have no breach yet, but in case it happens, we need to set up underlying layers to stop it when it actually happens. Okay. Yes. So as a board member, what, what do you think about the whole process? As in my pitch, do you feel like you would actually endorse it or you'd be like, ah, I think uh, I would I would probably be asking a lot more questions. Um, I think the second time you talked about uh, switching off access to um, switching off the um, connection to the internet, so people externally cannot access. What I haven't really grasped is still what the impact is when you do switch that off. Um, you've you've also talked about your assessment of the impact. So at this stage as a board member, I'm not sure what, how to perceive the level of risk, whether this is a crisis or whether it is something that you can handle internally as a CISO, uh, but for me, it's a different business. So that has not been, uh, I'm not clear what action to take based on the information you've given me. Uh, and I'm not clear what, whether external stakeholders need to be involved at this stage or based on the actual information that you've given me. So I'll probably probe a little more to try and find out more, uh, uh, more around the impact. Okay. Secondly, uh, now when it comes to this, like me talking about it, you find that it's, it's very inconvenient to keep on probing or you would find that there are specific like the way you say the specific key indicators that I am supposed to make sure that I put in my reference while talking to you to make things very easy and straightforward because it feels like you need to keep on asking now if you are, let's say I met you in like a very busy situation, would it be something you would actually take a listen to or you'll be like, ah, okay, we shall talk about it later. No, no, no. It's it's very important that we talk about it. I think what's in, what is more probably more important for you as the CISO is is also understand uh, that you because you're coming from a very technical background, but you are at the level where you're talking to people who don't have that technical know how. They they don't have the the knowledge. Even when you talk when you say Cisco, and you talk about OS. That's something that goes above people's heads because it's it's still very technical. So you need to look at it from the perspective of a uh, board member. When, you, when you're when you giving your pitch, you need to look at it from the perspective of a board member who does not know anything about IT. So they don't know what Cisco is, they don't know what OS is, they don't know what HTTP is, they don't know all of that. So the, the only language that they will understand is Something has happened. What is it that has happened? How does it impact us? What do we need to do about it? What support do you need from us as a board? As a board, so it, it's it needs to be such a lay in lay terms, and and of course when you talk numbers it helps. So if if you're a business that is, uh, perhaps has um, is is selling is an e-commerce site. And you know that your revenues, you generate a lot of revenue on the internet. And now people cannot access your your platform for whatever reason. If you say things like, as we've, we've, we've had to take the decision to switch off uh, access to internet uh, to, to our site, the impact of that is that we're going to be losing tens of thousands of dollars in lost sales. That is language. That the board understands, so they'll be able to 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 know that 
on a daily rate, on a daily basis, we make hundreds of thousands of dollars. If we're off for one day, that is what we use in terms of of of, um, of money. If you also say the impact of this is that our staff are going to be um, are going to be spending twenty-four man hours, whatever time it is, the resources that we're going to use. To, to try and mitigate this. This is, if you articulate it that way, it becomes very, very clear how this impacts the business and how, how, how important then the issue is or whether it's a crisis or whether it is not. So that language is important to, to board members. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the issue is, as I said, so never to make the assumption that people know the technical stuff. You know, Cisco, OS, it just goes over HTTPS. Okay. It does not mean anything. <laughs> so I never make that are... assumption. Yes, I guess we shall end here and I'll try my level best next time. Okay. Mm-hmm.